All right, we are recording. Fantastic. Okay. So, um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Raptor's Nest. I am Prasicor, the um, person who is Prasicor. And I am joined by the wonderful David King. I'm not that wonderful. <laughs> oh, I beg to differ, sir. Flattery will get you everywhere, <laughs> sir. I know, that's the idea. <laughs> um, he is joining us from uh, the Midnight Marinara YouTube channel, where you can listen to uh, audio recordings, like audio play recordings, adaptations of mm -hmm. your favorite creepypastas, as well as um, classic horror tales and obscure little uh, gems that you may or may not have heard of before. So lots of wonderful goodies over there. He also hosts the sister show, uh, Undercooked Analysis, where he and a bunch of idiots, um, <laughs> <laughs> who I hope to one day join, um, read stories and offer their analysis, which oftentimes is pretty undercooked. So, the uh, the podcast is pretty much just as undercooked as some of the stuff that we read uh, a lot of it is done on the fly the motto of undercooked analysis is no script, no plan, no filters no service um, no service but and no shoots no, bleh, bleh. no shirts, no shoes no service but no one cares anyway and, and whatever dead palette is on no pants either at least on his end <laughs> yeah it's so like, you it's, can just imagine us all sitting around, and uh, if we had a Skype call, we don't. And we all know that Dead Palette is uh, is pantsless every time. It's weird. You just somehow know listening. It's, yeah, there's just some. There's a there's a there's a change in his uh, his cadence. Yes. Yes. <laughs> anyway, oh so my goodness. moving on to the the meat and the subject of the discussion here. Uh, today we are going to be talking about horror the genre, um, and why it is so tropey, and uh, what can slash should we do about it. Is this a bad thing? Is this a good thing? Is it a neutral thing? Um, all right. Is it lawful evil? Is, is it, it chaotic neutral? <laughs> Let's see. Horror, I think chaotic evil as a genre. I think uh, that's pretty true. Uh, I think you could almost align certain styles of horror into classic D&D &D alignments if you wanted to, but that's a story for another time. <laughs> yes. I'd say in general chaotic evil, because it's all over the place. Yep. It most certainly is. <laughs> all right. So um, I guess uh, we'll, we shall begin with... Um, with Basically, just starting with the, the meaning of the word trope, um, because whenever I am in a discussion or argument with someone, I always like to start with definitions so that we're not arguing past each other. Or, yeah, let's I mean, make sure we're clear on our terms. Yeah, we're not we're not <laughs> arguing here, by the way, but, but just for just for the same thing, just clarity. Um, well, it's also important to distinguish that an argument is not always people just screaming at each other. Classically, an argument was two people with differing viewpoints getting together and uh, trying to get the other to understand said viewpoints. To win an argument is to prove that your point was better than the other person's point. But this is not an argument. This is a discussion. Correct. So, tropes. What is a trope? Because trope is a word that gets thrown around a lot um, without necessarily people understanding entirely what it means um mm -hmm. and especially sometimes something that can sometimes be a little annoying is when trope is used synonymously with cliche i uh, think it's pretty important to establish the distinction between what is a tr uh, trope and what is a cliche all right so let's start with that so, that's, that's a good start sure point. why why not that's yeah. the probably the best place to start so um in terms of tropes, uh, I think anybody who's familiar with the uh, sinkhole of time that is TV tropes might have some idea of what a trope is. Yeah, which will probably be quite a few people listening to this. I mean, um, hopefully. Yeah, um, of, of the four people who listen to this, I'm, I bet three of them will know what TV tropes is. <laughs> the fourth person uh, has been uh, living under a rock. <laughs> the, the, the first person. Hopefully, we've enlightened them and they can go 
look at TV tropes. Or maybe not. I can't, uh, in good conscience, advise going to look at TV tropes unless you have a lot of time on your hands. Or unless I hate you, you know, either one. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, in the case of um, TV tropes, though, basically the, the website's mission statement is that you uh, a trope is defined as something that is a, either a beat or a bit of shorthand in fiction. It's usually sort of a, a trope is sort of a, a, a thing that gets used in storytelling often frequently that can be cited very easily. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something familiar. It's something that is evocative and can bring up a certain... Uh, feeling or idea or sensation, what have you. Um, and there's multitudes of those. There's multitudes of tropes. And the f part of the fun of TV tropes is seeing where they will list a trope and uh, they will then show all the things that they can think of where that trope has been used or has been subverted in some cases. Because mm -hmm. uh, trope subversion is a thing where you think you know what's going to happen, and then suddenly it gets turned around. Yep, intentionally. Intentionally. Sometimes it can be done unintentionally, but usually it's intentionally when there's a conscious effort by the storyteller, uh, TV writer, whatever uh, the genre is being explored in, this particular, uh, in a particular trope. Yeah, people who don't suck are usually very good at subverting tropes. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> knowing the genre I work in uh, a lot of the time with the podcast, there are a lot of people whose writing is, well, whose writing sucks. Yes, but... <laughs> yes. Um, which I guess that's a pretty good segue into um, cliches, because oftentimes the stories that you deal with on the Undercooked Analysis podcast are riddled with them. Yeah, oh, definitely. Um, I think there's a pretty fine line between a trope and a cliche because people can see tropes before, but the difference between a trope and a cliche is it's a thing that you've seen time and again that maybe works okay, but uh, a cliche is something that is is old and sort of outstayed its welcome. Yep. If you know what I mean. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, you see it come up and you go, oh, this, that's so cliche. Yep. You know, you roll your eyes a little bit because you've seen it a million times and it doesn't work. It doesn't have an impact. It's something that evokes a negative reaction. Cliches are boring mm -hmm. and frustrating. <laughs> Speaking and, from experience uh, there. Unfortunately, there can be kind of that where one person's trope might be another person's cliche and vice versa. But I think... There's, there's still a clear line there because some things are very, very clearly cliches while other things are more in the trick camp of, uh, of tropes. Yeah, the things, here's the, where we can say what the things that are clearly cliches are is people usually intend to encounter them pretty early in their uh, experiences with media. Definitely. Um, um, they're usually something that has been, they're usually something pretty formulaic that you can kind of just see and you you just know kind of in your subconscious and your primal understanding that that's a cliche <laughs> yes and cl cliches are definitely subject to the law of diminishing returns um because cliches didn't start out as cliches um they started out working uh but through continued use and continued overuse um and through oftentimes not even being used very well or being used unconsciously, or being used without the uh, necessary context, they just, for whatever reason, do not work anymore. Mm -hmm. At the very least, they don't work very well anymore. Uh, people seem, some people seem to be under the delusion that they still work and still use them, but uh, no, they don't. They're wrong. Well, there are, and, and cliches can fall into all manner of things, uh, and if used poorly, they'll be really glaringly obvious. Uh, so even cliches that see frequently see use, they can have a they can have a bigger or smaller impact mm. depending on the cliche. Yep. Cliches can also be forgiven if um, everything around them, like all the writing and or whatever around them is good. Um, cliches might not have as bad an impact on something they might otherwise have if, if the things around them are good. Doesn't often happen, but eh, it's a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, do we want to maybe touch on an example of something specific that's a cliche and maybe something specific that's more of a trope? All right. That'd be a, probably a good idea. Uh, why don't you give us the cliche? All right. Uh, 
this one is one that I consider a cliche, and uh, it comes up all the time, uh, especially in um, like animated films for children or, or for families. And this is The Misunderstanding. Uh, the Misunderstanding is a beat in the story where uh, there's usually some character who has uh, um, thought has come to has has had a misunderstanding with another character like they they think they know something about another character in the story and suddenly their attitude all changes or everybody else's attitude all changes they think this character has done something wrong and they're immediately able to pass judgment this this usually brings the the a character who is the victim of the misunderstanding to a low point and at which point they have to go back and fix things even though maybe it's not always their fault um I am sick to death of this particular cliche. Uh, <laughs> I didn't like it to begin with, and I just hate it even more the 10,000th time around. Oh, yeah. It comes up, and it comes up all the time, it, particularly in Disney movies, when you mm. think about it. Yep. I'm trying to think of a specific example of a, uh, a misunderstanding cliche mm. from a specific movie that, like, everybody knows. Uh Okay, this might not be an example. This this is probably a bad example, but it's the one that, for whatever bizarre reason, is coming immediately to my mind. Um, mm-hmm. But it's in The Lion King when um, Scar convinces Simba that he is responsible for the death of Mufasa. Mm. I guess that's a little bit. There's a little bit of a variance of that one to my to my mind. Um, yeah. Or like. Um, or an, another close uh, cl- close cousin to the misunderstanding is also the liar revealed. The liar revealed, Ugh. and that's an even more egregious one. Yeah, uh, a character who who has inadvertently been forced into a lie and then is rolling with it um, suddenly gets it revealed, and then everybody hates that character. Yeah, and that character gets to their low point. Either the misunderstanding or the liar revealed. Uh, and I think the the the, 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 mis- the liar revealed is even worse. I do too. Yeah. Um, another ex- an example from again a movie that I don't care much for is um, is a Bug's Life. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> In which uh, you know, oh, they were never they were a circus troupe, not warrior bugs. You lied to us. You are banished. Get yep. out of here. It's pretty- Cute, long, sad sequence that's pointless. Yep. Yeah. It. Yeah. And an example of that is um, that's an example of a lie revealed done poorly anyway, because mm. it's like. Um, the lie itself was a bad lie. Like no, no thinking person should have been fooled by that lie to begin with. Yes, um, it's like you know, it's a, it's one of those things. Where like God, if even one of these characters wasn't an idiot, we could have avoided this entire plot. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's just if a cliche that's done poorly is like a double whammy, like really, oh yeah, really painful, <laughs> really hard to set through. That's a particularly pain, painful, and that's a particularly painful cliche. Both of those, the misunderstanding, I get really sick of after a while, as mm. I do the liar revealed. Yep. So, don't use those anymore, you guys. Yep. Disney, are don't you listening? <laughs> Disney, <laughs> there's a reason I don't watch your shit anymore. No, <laughs> <gasps> gasp. Um, no, it's not. That's not true. I They've know. been better about avoiding that. Uh, yeah, in their more recent films, which I like. Mm-hmm. Like, I think they recognize that it's a cliche and it's tired. It's uh, it's tired out. Yes. yes. Um, that doesn't really have that much to do with horror, of course, and I will get to that. But no, um, what... that's a cliche. That's a that's an example of a cliche. Something you just kind of hear about and you go like, uh, and you roll your eyes. Uh, the false death. That's another one. Mm-hmm. Where someone's a clear character. Uh, someone thinks a character has died mourns over them for a bit, is clearly shocked, and then that character stirs and comes back to life, and yeah. they're suddenly relieved and happy. Yeah, like the, the fake-out death. Which... Yeah. Oh. We're, not, we're talking about a happy... We're talking about a happy reveal, not, oh, we thought we killed the killer, but the killer has come back. Yeah. That's the horror version of that, and that's also a cliche. Yes. Although, if handled badly, it's a cliche, although that's kind of a trope of horror. You think you killed... The, you think the um, antagonist is out of the picture, antagonist suddenly rears back up and comes after you. Yes. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Never mind. Not important. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. I'm sure it must have been important somehow. No, it clearly wasn't because I forgot it. <laughs> anyway. It happens all the time. 
<laughs> All right. So so that's a cliche. So um, so what would be an example of like more of a straightforward trope? Um, um straightforward trope. Hmm. Well, usually a trope is something you can rec- like I said is you rec- recognize as kind of a form of shorthand that mm. can kind of you kind of know where things are going to go or you kind of have an idea. Certain settings can be tropes, certain character ideas can be tropes. All right, here, how about um, here's here's one that just came came to mind actually. This might help or maybe it won't. Um, okay. But one trope that just popped into my mind is um, the idea that reptiles are abhorrent, um, which is the idea that if you want to make a character um, evil and you want to communicate this very clearly and instantly to the audience, uh, associate them with reptiles in some way. <laughs> so, for example, if you're writing a young adult series about a boy wizard and his evil arch nemesis, why not go with the very popular snake motif? <laughs> um, are, are, you, I'm think, are you thinking of a very specific young boy wizard and a very specific snake-like individual? Because it yeah. seems like that. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. I assume we can't say what it is due to copyright reasons, but... <laughs> it's Percy Jackson. <laughs> anyway. Oh, oh, right. Okay. I thought you were going to say Aragon. <laughs> I I know nothing about either Percy Jackson or Aragon, but uh... I, I can vouch a little bit for Percy Jackson. It's kind of like American Gods for a younger audience. I can see that. Yeah, but uh, I can also vouch for Aragon only in that I saw the movie and it was terrible. No, it was terrible. It was. I can't imagine the books are that much better. <laughs> well, uh, seeing as how they're written, my... they're written by a kid, so you know. Yeah, well, and they borrow, like, just based on the basics of the, the fantasy setting, you want to talk about cliché. <laughs> it, it's, okay, when Tolkien did it, when Tolkien did it, it was new and different. When other people do it, it's, it's, it's cliché. Yes. Um, yeah, if they, if they don't have a good story and good characters go with it, then yeah, it's just a cliché. Um, this, what... this is why, um since we made the D&D references earlier, you make a, you, you have, if you're going to play D&D, the good thing about it is you don't have to worry about it so much in your group, but if you really want to make it interesting, you can use those fantasy tropes but give them a bit of a twist. Have your dwarf be not just a dwarf miner, have your dwarf be a sailor. That mm. would be pretty crazy, wouldn't it? Yes. The one dwarf sailor who's Was it? oddly polite and oh. also carries a, uh, a pair, like some flintlock pistols. Ooh, a dwarf pirate. Oh, that'd be pretty sweet. Somehow I knew you were going to go there. Um, <laughs> I was going to introduce Crossdresser into the equation, but I, I don't know. Oh, a dwarf cross, Crossdresser would be great. Dwarf, dwarf Crossdressing Pirate. All right. How about, how about you have the main character of your fantasy story be a female dwarf? Mm-hmm. With full beard. Like the full, yeah. The, 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 the straight up main character that you focus on the entire story, female dwarf. Mm-hmm. How often does that actually come up in fiction? I'm not sure. Female, dwarf, cross-dressing, pirate. Deviant art, make it happen. Okay, so there you go. Sorry, we're, <laughs> we got a little bit off the rails there, but you were saying about uh, the lizard. Yeah, analogy. so, yes, so um, we were saying, like you said earlier, tropes are shorthand. So it's a way to communicate an idea or an emotion quickly. Um, mm-hmm. So... so that's 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 what you would do if you have a villain and you want to communicate clearly that this guy is evil. Um, give them a reptile motif. So whether they, you know, talk to snakes or turn into giant snakes or command an army of lizard people or whatever the fuck they're doing with reptiles, I don't know. Maybe um, they have reptilian eyes. Yep, possibly. Uh, a reptilian penis. You never know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure what we're going into there, but that might be a plus for some people there. <laughs> I'm sure it is, but then again, <laughs> who cares what those people think? Anyway. <laughs> I'm sure they care. I'm sure the, you know, at least one of the four people listening is like, <laughs> how dare you? Oh, God, one of my... How dare? I'm going back to my erotic dinosaur fiction. Hey, 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 hey. Feathers. You know, I was, each their own. I was about to each say, I was actually about to say, oh God, one of my four listeners is a scaly. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they're into, they're into, um, they're into sort of pre-avian 
ideas. <laughs> they're into stem. They're into stem birds. Anyway. Oh gosh. To, to bring it back to a place of sanity here. Thank you. Um. <laughs> so tropes versus cliches. Tropes are good. Cliche or tropes can be good. Tropes can be used poorly, of course. But tropes are solid tools of any creator. Cliches are broken tools of any creator. Mm-hmm. Don't use broken tools. Yes. Um, if you don't, do... Don't do it. <laughs> invest in understanding genre, understanding tropes, and uh, your, your writing might have a distinct... Your writing, your storytelling, whatever you do, might have a distinct advantage. Mm-hmm. Tropes are not... And tropes can be applied to anything, not just screen and and the page but tropes can be applied to video games tropes can be applied to art tropes traditional can, art yeah tropes can be applied to literally any form of communication any it's ex- any time when you're trying to put the ideas in your head into somebody else's head you're going to be using tropes of some kind you might also use clichés of some kind you might if you're Study awful, your tropes yeah. and you might, and your next date might go very well. <laughs> oh God! Uh, <laughs> or maybe not, because even TV tropes itself warns against being too scientific with the use of tropes. Oh, what, I, what I'm saying is, understand your tropes, and you'll know when and when not to use them. Oh yeah, right, right, yes. Um, Key emphasis on when and not. Be your own person, you guys. No means no is a trope. <laughs> There's also a trope <laughs> on TV tropes that's called Dude, She's Like in a Coma. <laughs> oh, God. And I'm like, yeah, know your tropes. Because <laughs> oh, then that happens. Um, yeah. So now let's, let's <laughs> after all these tangents, let's try bringing it back to horror here. All right. A so, good way to bring it back to horror would be to utilize a certain cliche. Hold on a second. All righty. <laughs> I know the Trope or cliche. Uh, cliche. Um, Wolf howling in the distance. Yep. Yeah. Uh, unless so. unless your movie is actually about wolves or dogs or werewolves or something like that, there's no. Garou. <laughs> there's absolutely no reason why we should be hearing wolves. In the background, this is this cliche is sometimes so poorly used it will be you will hear wolves where they're where, where wolves don't live, uh-huh. like you like you'll be in Africa and be, can't, people around the campfire and they hear wolves in the distance. Like, wait a minute, wolves? <laughs> and someone and no one you sometimes people don't bring it up. The way to subvert that would be to have them go, "This is Africa. Why are there wolves?" And then have yep. someone be like, "Could be wild dogs." Yeah. See, that's an example of another phenomenon that's uh, well-known in TV tropes called lampshade hanging. Oh, yes, lampshading. Which which is a bizarre phenomenon, and the, the term itself is rather weird. People don't seem to understand it. But here's basically how it works. Imagine you're sitting in a room with a person having a conversation, an important conversation about an important topic. And in the corner of the room, there's this light that's on, like a lamp. And there's no lampshade on it. It's just this big, bright light in the corner of the room. And you're trying to listen to the person. You're trying to be part of the conversation, but your eyes keep drifting over to that light. It's really, really distracting. Uh-huh. Now, there's a couple things you can do. Um, you can just walk out of the room and end the conversation. You can <laughs> soldier on and try to be a, a good listener despite the lamp being there. Or you can ask the person to pull, politely to pause the conversation go put a lampshade on top of that lamp, and then go back to your conversation. And now it's easier because the lamp has been shaded. The idea... You best hope there's a... Sorry. <laughs> um, the idea behind lampshading is that if you quickly and in a you know smooth way draw attention to the weird thing in your story, that by doing drawing attention to it, you can move on from it. And it, uh-huh. won't, it won't be as bothersome anymore. It can be used for comedy sometimes. Mm-hmm. It can be used to make a point. It can be used to try and show... Sometimes there there is examples of poor lampshading. Oh, yes. Uh, if lampshading... Most of the time, lampshading is used by people who understand 
what they're doing. Yes. Um, but an example of poor lampshading is like when you tell a joke that's not funny and you say, yeah, I know that wasn't very funny. It's like, <laughs> nope, the, the joke was still unfunny. You still didn't get your laugh. Um, and in that case, if a person keeps doing that again and again and again, just keeps hanging lampshades, at some point, you just kind of got to go, you know, instead of hanging all these lampshades, maybe you should have just gone back and written a better story. You know? <laughs> There's some weird exotic lampshades in here, guys. Like, <laughs> this house is full of them. This is weird. <laughs> And, you know, this whole thing could have been avoided if they had just gone with one other option, which is to tell the person you're talking to, hey, this light is really distracting me. Can we, like, move for a second? And then you move and get the, the person you're talking to between you and the bright light. And then they're all, they're all cast in silhouette. But at least they're facing you and not the light. <laughs> and you, their bulk is now blocking the light. I don't understand where that comes into play in this particular metaphor. I was about to it ask. felt like something that needed to be said. Well, now that it has been said... Cool. Um, so <laughs> life goes on. Um, so, hopefully, so yeah. So um, going back to this idea of a horror cliche, um, mm -hmm. the idea behind hearing a wolf howling in the distance is supposed to be creepy. It's supposed to be foreboding and like, oh, there's something out there that's you know dangerous. It's supposed to evoke a creepy mood, but that's not what happens when you hear that. Um, at best, you will just kind of ignore it, um, and at worst, you'll you know chuckle like, really, you're going with the wolf howl. Um, this is particularly egregious if this is like a stock wolf howl that you've heard in fifty other movies before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's one. Th it's important to understand, though. Again, that if you um, and oh, stock sound effects. <laughs> oh, I can tell you about stock sound effects. <laughs> I was. Um, I knew you could. Uh, well, I mean, the, but the important thing when it comes to this specific, specifically the wolf howl, as we already mentioned, is if your movie, if your movie or your story has something to do with wolves, or wolves are actually present, mm -hmm. then yeah, you can be forgiven a little bit for that. Especially in horror, in a horror example, if the wolf howl, if you want your wolf howl to actually evoke a sense of dread, hope make the wolves an actual threat. Or mm. werewolves, or whatever sort of thing is howling out in the dark. Then, suddenly, that means something. It means something is out there, something is hunting, and something is drawing nearer, potentially. Correct. Yes. Um... But, on the topic real quick, of stock sound effects, um, I would be remiss if I did not bring up Castle Thunder. Really? Yes. <laughs> um, Castle Thunder is a... If you've seen... It, it, at this point, it's a lot of people consider it a cliche, but it's one of those kind of loving cliches, you know? Mm. Like, it think, it's like the Wilhelm scream. Yes. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, now have, I now have uh, David King doing the Wilhelm scream recorded. Feel free, you can, you can use that as a, as a poor man's Wilhelm scream from now on. <laughs> The, the Castle of Thunder, though, if you've seen an old horror movie or you've seen uh, something that's sp usually poking fun at horror, it's generally used in a more comedic or lighthearted context now, you've probably heard Castle Thunder. It's known as Castle Thunder because it was initially, I think, used in a lot of the old Universal movies in the 1940s. Yes, so where you'd have a, a big castle sitting on a mountain cliff face. Um even where there aren't any mountains or any castles. Um, and you get a sh you know, wide shot, exterior shot of the castle, and then thunderclap and lightning strike, if they have the budget. It, it, oh, yeah. And if you, <laughs> if you understand uh, you know, your sound design, you'll recognize the particular cadence, the particular uh, pattern of this particular thunderclap. Even if and, you uh, haven't, um, even if you've just seen enough horror movies... You'll recognize yeah. it. Well, that's true, and that is true. Certain stock sound effects, I trust, will stick mm -hmm. out to you in time. Like the, a specific wolf howl, a specific um, sound of a of a blade biting through flesh, you know, mm. stuff like that. <laughs> yes. But Castle Thunder is the example I, I love to cite because uh, I personally love it. I love hearing it. It makes me a little bit nostalgic. Uh, is it overused? 
Well, yeah, but if it, it, you, I wouldn't use it seriously anywhere anymore. Context is very important, but it's fun to hear in certain situations. Uh, I know that I myself have used Castle Thunder in um, in my version of the story and song from the Haunted Mansion, but that was to evoke the fact that that stock sound is used in the Disneyland ride as well as the old record that it was based on. Yeah, so actually that would probably be a good moment for um, for me to put that sound effect in so that just people um, can listen to it and, you know, chuckle as they most likely recognize it. All right, All right. So, so brace yourselves. Here comes Castle Thunder. And go! Ooh. <laughs> oh, God, baby, Classic. chills. You got the, you got the heebie-jeebies? Yes. Jeepers Creepers. Oh. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, no. <laughs> Zoink, oh, Scoob. All right. So we, those are a couple silly tropes, though. But, I mean, the, why why is horror so tropey, I believe, is one of the uh, main points we're going to discuss here, right? Yes. Yep. So why is horror so tropey? Um, and I think one of the points that, that I kind of came up with was is that... Um, Horror, unlike other um, types of uh, other genres, is is going for a very specific emotion that it's trying to elicit out of its audience. So, looking at an example of a non-horror movie, um, just off the top of my head, because it's a movie I know very well, uh, Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park is a movie that uh, tries to evoke several different types of emotion throughout. Uh, there's funny parts. There's beautiful parts, there's sad parts, there's scary parts. Um, but the tone, the overall tone, isn't going necessarily for any one specific type of emotion. Whereas horror yes. is. Horror is trying to target fear and keep that tonally consistent throughout the entire movie. Mm. This. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it's very true. It also serves as a reminder that John uh, John Hammond is a necromancer. Okay. <laughs> More or less, pretty much. Yeah, basically. Um, yep. Um, it's fascinating, though. But yeah, no, it's it's you know uh, think uh, it it understands the thing is with Jurassic Park too is it understands what to use in the parts where they need to be used. Yes. You know? mm -hmm. Definitely. When it needs heartwarming moments, it can have heartwarming moments. When it needs beautiful moments, it has those. And when it get when it needs scary moments, oh man. <laughs> yes. Quite. When you have um, a couple of kids <laughs> being. Um, stuck under a car in the rain while a giant T-Rex is bearing down on them with its huge head and there's that fairly seamless transition between um I, well I mean you can kind of tell but because it's it you your uh, sense of disbelief is suspended because there's actual animatronics and then there's actual and then sometimes every so often you get the CGI versions of the dinosaurs and uh I don't know where I'm going with this except for the fact that um well, the next situation where your horror tropes are used well. You've got a dark night. It's raining. Yeah, uh, um, it, it was a dark, stormy night when the T-Rex escaped. Is, I wouldn't say it's even a cliche. Uh, it was a dark and stormy night. No, no. Um, again, it, it's all about context. And um, when, a, when a Tyrannosaurus Rex is escaping from uh, an enclosure and is going to attack and kill people, um, there's, you know... It's, it's much more effective if that happens during a violent, torrential downpour in the middle of the night than if it were to happen on a partly cloudy, you know, Tuesday afternoon. Yes. In, in clear weather. Now, horrifying stuff can still happen in those kind of contexts. Uh, oh, yeah. In no. fact, that, that's a form of subversion right there. Right. Uh, in fact, I was really hoping that Jurassic World would go down that route um, mm. to have uh, bloody death and horror happen uh, in the middle of this beautiful theme park in the middle of the in the middle of the day with the beautiful sun shining down and everything's supposed to be fun and safe and pleasant so well as these people are on vacation and then they get ripped to shreds. Yes, is that not what happened? You have to forgive me. I never saw Jurassic World. Uh, there's there's one scene that gets very close to that, 
Um, but it PG 13s all over itself. And the uh, effect you doesn't. Want, you want to see? You want to see the <laughs> aftermath where you've got uh, burning uh, uh, kiosks and yeah. uh, torn apart tourists lying all over the path. I want. I want to see. I want to see the bloodied, um, chopped up remains of. Oh uh, God, what's his name? Um, who's the Margaritaville guy? <laughs> Oh, Jimmy Buffett. Jimmy Buffett. Yeah, I want to because he was there that day. Yeah, <laughs> when, when he, those... got, he got he got the fuck out of there <laughs> yeah, with his two with, with his, his two uh, margaritas. With his margaritas in his yeah. hands. I think. Yes. Yep. Um, I only know this despite not having seen the movie because I was once in a Margaritaville restaurant and they played that scene. Of course, of course they did. Yeah. Uh, promotional <laughs> tie-ins. Damn you. Um... So yes, uh, where are we going with this? Well, I guess uh, <laughs> tropes are a good way of again with with uh, with horror, as we said before. Horror is trying to get you to react a very specific sort of way. It wants to elicit fear, and when a movie is very specifically built around that, there's going to be certain forms of things that people go to because they're tried and true at evoking fear. Yeah, much like again, like comedy does. Comedy does that. It's trying to evoke a sense of it's trying to make you laugh. This is trying to make you scared, and so it goes to things that have been proven before to scare people. Yes, and um, it basically remember we use the analogy that tropes are tools, um, and mm -hmm. tools work. So if you're trying to build something, I mean, you use tools. Now the problems come in when you don't know how to use the tools, or you don't know what tools are most effective for which thing. So it's mm -hmm. like let's say. You have a hammer, and you know, oh, hammers are used for hammering in nails, and you know that much. Oh, I've been using the hammer wrong this whole time. <laughs> but yeah, but then you use the Jeez. handle. You, you hold it by the actual hammering part, and you try hammering in with the handle. It's like you, <laughs> you just don't know how to use the tool right, and that's what happens well, here. Is what people. I've learned something here today. I've been using a hammer wrong for years. Thank you. Well, it's okay. I mean, I was using a chainsaw wrong for years, so. <laughs> vroom, vroom, baby. Yeah. Oh God. Um, so yeah, uh, if you don't if you don't use tropes the right way, um, then you, it's gonna show. Mm -hmm. Um. So that's where we get into uh, why horror being so tropey can be a bit of an issue, is when you don't know how to use those tropes, um, or if you just throw in a bunch of cliches and think those will work. A trope can easily become a cliche in a specific genre, too, where yep. a trope might, where a cliche, it might not be cliched in another genre, especially if it comes out of nowhere, it can... Uh, it, that sort of thing can easily be considered um, a cliche in a context of horror. Um, like so, I mentioned earlier, the killer getting up and coming after you again. Um, border can, in, in the right context, I'd say it's more trope than cliche, but can totally be a cliche, especially if it happens more than once. Yeah, if it happens more than in once. The same story. Yeah, and, it, and also if it's like if it's very obvious, that like this this should have killed a person. Like mm -hmm. if they if they get like fifty bullets in them. And then they're set on fire and pushed off a cliff, and they still come back after that. Then you're just like, "Oh, come on." Mm -hmm. um, I think one. I, I, I'm trying to think of egregious examples, but come on, people who who listen to this, uh, I assume, know a thing or two about horror, and therefore uh, know can probably count on their hand how many times they've seen a movie where they the heroes have thought they've dealt with the the. Um, here's here's an example of it used per, poorly. Uh, the heroes have thought they've dealt with the villain. The villain is dead or lying there prone, and they all sigh with relief, and they just leave. Or they set their weapons down and then leave. <laughs> well, we better not, like, burn the body and then, like, you know, sow the ground where it was burned with salt or something like that. Because clearly we've won. There's no way he's going to get up again. And, of course, we, the audience, at this point, know this is at the end. That's the killer is going to come back. The antagonist <laughs> yeah. is going to rise again, and maybe possibly have a jump, or if only just to have a jump scare at the end of the movie. Yeah, and that yeah, that's um, 
that's that's a really good example because on the one hand um i think the jump scare version is probably the one i've seen more often than not but um still yeah again the reason you see is because it's horror and they gotta get that one last scare in before the end credits roll yep yep um, it's funny because, uh, uh, to give an example, me and uh, Kayla just watched uh, Krampus for the first time a couple days ago. Oh, okay. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Excellent movie. Uh, it tropes up the wazoo, but the thing is, it's horror. It's got tropes. It's got things to expect. Yep. I'm, I w- it was fun the way it used some of them, and some of them were kind of like, okay, well, sure, this is a bit weird. But uh, at the very end, it had that. It had one final jump scare that came out of nowhere. Did it bother me? Not really, because for some reason the movie had this charm to it where it was kind of self-aware in some places. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that's a weird thing about tropes as well uh, when talking about them in the context of specific works is that you you can point to, like, tropes and say that you particularly hate, you know, pet peeve tropes. We all have them. Um, My my pet peeve trope actually is jump scares. Yeah, but for some reason you might watch a movie where it has your pet peeve trope in there but for some reason it doesn't bother you as much as it does in other um in other movies or books or whatever uh-huh. um, and that and that's that is just a a reminder to all of us of how fucking complicated uh the relationship between um tropes and writing and you know creation of art is is that even the, even when there are things we think we know don't work and things we think we know we're going to hate. Um, and then things like that happen, and you're just, eh, you don't know. Yeah, we, we don't know. Um, Which is the really again, scary uh, part. And it's funny, because, again, one of the reasons horror is so susceptible to this is it, it, it uses a lot of people, there's a lot of horror, and a lot of people going, oh, that worked really well that one time, I want to use that too. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's whole subgenres of horror that are kind of tropes in themselves. Look at um, the zombie apocalypse scenario. Yep. yep. That wasn't always a thing. We have uh, George Romero to kind of to thank for that. Yes. Or if you want to cite an earlier source, uh, the uh, the Last Man on Earth or I Am Legend. Yep. Yeah. So George I'll Romero. The original with Vincent Price. Yes. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, George Romero made a movie about carpentry, carpentry. Um, with God. some zombies in it, um, and then this. <laughs> Ghouls, actually, not zombies. Um, right. That, but they, but he he established a way that zombies are zombie. The Walking Dead, mm-hmm. the undead, the flesh eating ghouls, uh, whatever variation you want, are going to work for the foreseeable future, basically. Yep. Yeah. So you know, you this is again this is an example where we can trace all the zombie media we have today, or all of the the sort of the non voodoo ones anyway. Um, mm-hmm. From you know, Walking Dead and, and all that type of stuff, we can trace that back through all the um, Living Dead movies uh, of Romero and his kin, um, going all the way back to Night of the Living Dead. And before that, you don't have these types of movies, or you might have similar things with similar elements, um, but not in their modern form. So, for example, actually, one strange sort of precursor to Night of the Living Dead. Um, was this before, was this before Night of the Living Dead? I think it was, uh, but I might be wrong. I'm probably I'm probably wrong just because I'm always wrong. Um, but the birds, uh, oh. actually, I mean, think about it. By the end, they're holed up in a house. Um, significant amount of screen time is devoted to carpentry, as they um, <laughs> board up the windows and doors. Um, and they're trying to keep the uh, malevolent forces out. Um, while and also, they're swarming. They're swarming. Yep, they're swarming. And there's also this debate raging about um, what what should we do? We can't just stay here. Uh, should we try to leave? You know. So there's so yeah. So even though that's not with zombies, that's with dinosaurs. Um, instead. <laughs> When it, whenever I've always said I've always joked with people like oh yeah my favorite Alfred Hitchcock movie is the one where dinosaurs try to take over the world um, that's a pretty good one yeah um, but yeah so, he, yeah, so that's an example of where a lot of the tropes of the zombie apocalypse movie are there even though we haven't gotten the zombie part yet um, right. it's a bird apocalypse so the, but the yeah the idea of the of the um, sort of like 
a horde. It, I mean, that's that, that's existed for a long time, but mm -hmm. there's the and and uh, the idea, like the you know, the birds are are the part of what makes the birds uh, like the difference between the zombies and the and the birds though is that the birds are exhibiting sort of a a cunning in what they do and a maliciousness that you could kind of attribute to human behavior. Yes. And that's what makes them terrifying. What makes zombies terrifying is that they're not human. Mm. They look like humans, but they're they're mindless, they're shambling, they exhibit animalistic tendencies. Yes. They their only purpose is to is to uh, destroy and consume. Yep. This this pretty much this exact point was actually brought up in the podcast I did with Dead Palette about monsters. Um, is it? Yes. Uh, where we oh. have, yeah, where we have the idea of the birds are scary because they are non-human creatures exhibiting human qualities, whereas we have he used Michael Myers, oh. yeah, he used Michael Myers in in his example, but again, where we have um, a human creature exhibiting non-human qualities. You know, um, that just goes to show that uh, me and Dead Palette, who, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dead Palette is my co-host on. Um, on the undercooked analysis podcast and a good friend uh he and i think a lot alike when it comes to horror and uh we understand I, I like to think we both have a pretty good understanding of the genre so the fact that i went there without even uh <laughs> having heard that particular episode is kind of shocking to me right now all you've just told me is that you don't listen to my show <laughs> i'm sorry i've been meaning to Oh, anyway, enough gratuitous self promotion. Um, so, hey, if you're not listening to this show that you're already listening to, you should listen to the Raptors Nest. With... <laughs> uh, Am I helping? I don't know. Did actually, I, I, don't, I think I think it's only possible to help at this point. Um, All right. Okay, let me let me give another example though of uh, while while it's dwelling on me because you know eventually movie the, the the writers themselves became aware of just how trope filled horror is. Yes. Look at Scream. Mm -hmm. Yes. Scream is all about that. Scream is all about people who understand how horror works, how the slasher genre works. Yep. Um, and, and another great thing about Scream is that Scream brings it to the forefront. Uh, Scream mm -hmm. brings the self awareness to the actual. Um, uh, like the main storyline and the whole premise of the movie, but self-aware horror goes back even further than that. Uh, oh yeah, writers who who are starting to realize um, the the tropiness of horror and then start to play with that. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I think in, in, if that being the case, that and then that being the case, that's that is the one of the advantages of horror uh, is that people who know it understand and, and and you know genuinely want to do it can under, understand what works and what doesn't and can play around with that more mm -hmm. that's the that's the best part of creating horror is playing with the tropes oh yeah you want to try and find because the the best part about horror is in my mind having elements of the unknown and the unexpected that's that's where a lot of it comes from one of my favorite tropes that was named on um tv tropes is called nothing is scarier mm-hmm and it's the idea, and I legitimately agree, is that sometimes the absence of something happening is more horrifying than actually seeing something happen. It's the anticipation, it's the dread, it's the unknown, it's that thing that you don't see, it's that thing that you never see. Uh, mm -hmm. One of my favorite, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you would define it as horror, but uh, one of my favorite thrillers, I guess, I guess you could call it horror, is um, The Haunting which is based on the uh, Shirley Jackson novel. Yeah, I'd call that horror. Yeah, and the best part the best part to me about that movie is you've got a bunch of characters in a haunted house, uh, clearly a bizarre, uh, mind-warping house, uh, but you never see a single ghost. Mm hmm yeah. You never see a physical manifestation of the presence of the haunting. Everything is done through... Um, the characters themselves through the house itself through bizarre camera angles and odd sounds there's a presence there's a clear and obvious presence in the mansion with them but you never see it hmm. you never see it physically you never see a, a ghostly form or anything like that if anything that makes it a lot scarier especially when something is thumping down the hall at night or pressing against the door or uh, cackling off in the distance. Yeah. That, some of the most chilling scenes in that movie are just the characters cowering while something thrashes in the hall outside. Mm -hmm. 
I love that. I, I, it still gives me chills when I watch it, and I've seen that movie a lot. <laughs> yes. Um, that I do also love that trope. Um, mm-hmm. I, I do have a limit, though. Um, if, it, if it's clear to me that this, this trope is being used not because the director understands that nothing is scarier, but because they just don't want to show the horrible puppet they've created... <laughs> um, then it, it shatters it for me. Um, is that a is that a reference to uh, to uh, Jaws at all? Um, no, actually, because I I love I I love Jaws. My God, I fucking Jaws love is Jaws. amazing. I mean, um, if yeah. anything, that was a happy accident because we don't see much of the shark until the very mm-hmm. end, and they wanted to show the shark more. We didn't get to see the shark more though because the the animatronic uh, figure yeah. for. Uh, Bruce uh, mechanically failed a lot. Yeah, yeah, it was not working the way they wanted it to work, and doing the things they the needed to do. Not working. <laughs> um, uh, but, but that no, because that's an example of that trope done right. Because when yes. when because the puppet the animatronic does have its moments. Um, yes. And even though a lot of people look back and say, "Oh, it looks so fake," all I'm thinking is, "Wow, you have this giant robot shark that is." Working in the ocean. Um, this is this is why I pref- I generally prefer practical effects because even if you see a thing that is um, mechanical and o- or obviously a puppet or something like that, at least it's real. At least mm-hmm. it's actually there, and yes. you can kind of appreciate some of the what went into it. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, no, it's- undoubtedly. Um, so yeah, even going a similar thing. Uh, Jurassic Park three. I mean, God, I hate that movie, but. <laughs> Um, the scene where the uh, giant animatronic Spinosaurus is is in the lake um, fishing for people, um, that is so incredible to watch. Um, mm-hmm. Just to see this giant robot monster uh, that's moving in, you know, as if it's real. I mean, that's wow. I mean, that's yeah. I got to give them credit for something like that, even. <laughs> um, but you're not no. So the the Jaws is is an example of what I call the the catharsis of nothing is scarier. Yes. So um, going back to Jurassic Park, um, uh, who, who very obviously where they have the the special effects to back the nothing up. Um, uh-huh. So in the scene where um, Doctor Sattler is, is going down to turn the power back on, and she's in that cramped dark. Um, like tunnel thing, and, and Malcolm's telling her what to do over the walkie-talkie. Um, again, you, you there's this tension where you you you're dreading something to happen, and yes. you you almost want something to happen um, mm-hmm. because then at least then at least you know um, then at least it's over with. Um, so that's an example where you have all this tension building, all this tension building. Things you you suddenly now things are more. There's a relief. There's a release, um, and this is very clever, actually, because um, that you'd think that's how it would, like that's sort of the, how the cliche would work, is if you think, oh, we're safe, and then the monster attacks. That's of course that's the cliche. Um, this is an example of where they hide the cliche. Oh yeah. So, um, so she's turning on the power, and there's already another scene going on where there's tension, where the kid is on the fence. And the electric fences are being turned on. She thinks, oh, God, you got to get the kid off. Got to get the kid off. So that's where your attention is being misdirected. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when he gets electrocuted, that's the catharsis. That's the release where you're like, oh, God, well, at least something happened now. And, yeah. then two, and then two seconds later, the Velociraptor attacks. Right. You hadn't mm-hmm. seen the ra- ra- You hadn't really seen the raptors in the movie until that point. Nope, nope. That was the first close-up shot. Um, yeah, and it's it, – well, it's preceded – I'm trying to remember. Is this? Does the severed arm land on Doctor Sattler's shoulder before that raptor or after the raptor? After. Okay. After. Yeah. Because that was kind of funny. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. No. Yeah. That was that was hilarious. That, I, that, I feel bad for Samuel L. Jackson though, getting uh, torn apart by raptors. It's but, it's a, uh, it is a common um, uh, joke among Jurassic Park fans that uh, Samuel L. Jackson survived that encounter. Um, he has a gun now mounted to his arm. And he, he just lives on the island. <laughs> That's kind of awesome. I yeah. mean, there was there was all those people who said that canonically. Um, why do I not remember the name of the hunter guy? Oh, Muldoon. 
Robert Muldoon. Muldoon. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So there's people who say, no, Muldoon wasn't actually killed. He totally yeah. just... The raptor, was, with the, raptor the raptor was playing with him. I've actually heard like, some fans say that, that the raptor was just playing with him. I, I, As you I, hear I, his face being torn off. Oh, yeah. This, <laughs> oh, it's terrible. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, there's there's a, there you go. There's an example of of a of a nice buildup of tension, a release, and then a fake out. And um, I think the most important thing with horror, especially when it comes to tropes, is the careful building and main, maintaining of tension. Mm-hmm. Yes. The slow and steady buildup to a scare is so much better than just being in a situation and all of a sudden, boo, a scare. Yep. And the reason That's, for that. Uh, that's oh. commonly referred to in horror, I think, in, at least in tropes, as the cat scare. Yes. It's um, it's cheap. It's terrible. It needs to go away. <laughs> yes. Um, here, ironic thing about the cat scare, um, you think, you you think because the idea is that it's like, oh, a cat just shrieked and ran out of a garbage can. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, here's the thing. The, the cat scare, as we know, it probably originates with the movie Cat People. Um, mm-hmm. But despite the title and despite the name of the trope, um, it's not a cat that causes the cat scare in Cat People. It's a bus. Right. That's actually, and, and the weird thing is that's a bizarrely effective scene because of, at least there was some bizarre tension before that. Yes. Yeah. It's the, you know, the set the mood. There's a, there's a woman walking down a dark street. It's completely silent. Mm-hmm. You, you can tell that she's nervous because she's all by herself. Mm-hmm. She's walking along and you could just kind of hear the click of her footsteps, you know? Yep. Her shoes on the pavement. She's walking along. She's she's tense. She gets more tense. She looks over her shoulder. There's she maybe she feels like something's following her. All of a sudden and a bus pulls up. Yep. And <laughs> Oh god, it was just a bus. Yep. That's and yeah. I can forgive that. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, because it's still working, and because the rest of the movie is, is so good as well. Um, right. and, be, and because it's it wasn't... Earned, it's earned the right to have that. Yeah. Also, it wasn't a cliche at that point. Um, no, it's true. It's an older it's an older movie. Right. Um, so, yeah, here's the thing. If you're making a movie that's like an hour and a half, two hours long, um, and you want people to be scared throughout that entire movie, or most of it at least, um, mm. you can't just have it be jump scares. Um it's it's like this idea of like okay you know like when you're looking at comments on YouTube which I don't know why you're doing that my God what's wrong with you um, but there's like that idiot who's like put all caps uh, the, you know we all know these people the idiots who type in all caps um, well the problem with that is that they've now because they've emphasized everything they have said nothing um, and that's the whole point here is that. If, you're, if there's no tension, if there's no buildup, if there's no none of that creeping sense of dread that's being, you know, stretched out. I mean, that's that's actually, if you think about it, there's actually a really practical reason for um, tension building, which is that it's a great way to stretch the fear out over time. Yep. Um, and then, because, you know, again, you can't have those moments of, like, uh, you know, cat scares and jump scares. Those can only last for so long. You can't build an entire two-hour story around that. Plus, if you're going to have a sense of realism, you've got to have some downtime where you get to know the characters, get to know maybe the history of the situation that they're in or mm-hmm. location or things like that. You know, things that are important to actually building a story, just a general story. Yep. And that's another, probably another reason why um, the tropiness of horror can sometimes feel uh, like it's, it's a problem, which is that people are so concerned with scaring they forget they're telling a story mm-hmm. with people, with characters who we are supposed to, on some level, relate to, maybe even like, um, if we're lucky. Uh, the, although some stories will have you caring more about the uh, the force that is trying to eliminate oh, yeah. the quote-unquote protagonists, and you know those are just as viable. Yep. There's something very um, appealing about watching uh, a group of you know, here, here's a cliche: a group of co- you know college, college somethings out partying and getting into trouble, yep. being picked off one by one because they're so thoroughly unlikable. Yep, yep. I mean, when people say they hate uh, the second Jurassic Park movie, um, they hate it for that exact reason 
because it's a yeah. bunch of idiots who are basically causing everything to go wrong. I'm like, but yeah, but then you have the satisfaction of seeing them get killed and eaten. Oh, yeah. Um, the nice thing about, I mean, the interesting thing about Jurassic, the first Jurassic Park, is yeah. that you get to like some of these characters. Oh, yeah, which is... You which know, is even the ones that are unlikable, you kind of like a little bit. Like, yeah. there's something fun about them. Yes, which is probably the single biggest improvement of the movie over the novel. Um, oh, yeah. It, is, it has been said on many times that Michael Crichton is an ideas guy. Um, he comes up with interesting ideas, um, but for a guy that could not write a likable person, um, his <laughs> life depended on it. Um, well, this is why the movie is, uh, in a lot of ways, superior to yeah. the oh, yeah. uh, novel. Definitely, yep. Right. Um, and we can thank Spielberg for that. Um, thank you, Steven. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Steven. Thank you, Stephen. We, we know him well enough that we just re- refer to him by his first name. Yes, thank you, Stephen. You're welcome. <laughs> Stevie boy. Oh, did, did you catch that? To catch what? You, when you said thank you? No, I didn't. Say it again. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I knew I I when he said as soon as you said did you catch that when, did you hear me when he said thank you he's like I knew you were gonna do that <laughs> of but course I, but we have to have it in there it's essential you're welcome <laughs> it's still one of my uh, personal favorite uh, quips from uh, Mystery Science Theater <laughs> I know anyway do you think we've we've covered our bases here pretty much. Um, the only thing I guess we can think of, which is, so we've answered the first part of the question, is well, why is horror so tropey? Then we move on to the final part, which is what can slash should we do about it? Um, and I wanted I wanted to throw that should in there because when when people talk about the tropiness of horror, they oftentimes do it with a kind of more more like a negative connotation, right. that um, connotation. That's how that word is pronounced. Yes. Um, yes. That, um, you know, oh, it's just so many tropes. Um, whereas, again, it's the problem is not that horror is tropey. Horror needs to be tropey. Horror, um, horror thrives on being tropey. Yeah, horror wouldn't work without not only... Well, here's the thing. Um, any type of communication, like we said before, uses tropes. Um, it is impossible to tell a story or create a work of art... That does not use tropes. It is impossible. Um, and even if it were possible, I don't think I'd want to read that story or see that movie. Mm-hmm. Um, so It's very true. Yes, yeah, yeah. so that tr- horror is tropey is not in and of itself a bad thing. There are just some problems that we've identified here. Um, so then let's talk about some of the solutions. Yes. Well, I mean, just to, and just to clarify real quick, I, the, again, this is why we had to distinguish horror or just in general what's the difference between a trope and a cliche Mm -hmm. you can say horror has a lot of cliches and it does but just like any genre it's just really easy to identify with horror because the tropes can get pretty tired after a while and then start to become cliches if used poorly Mm -hmm. so but yes let's let's talk about solutions instead let's let's end this on let's end this on an optimistic note yes yes of course um so I think the number one thing here is understanding. You you have to understand the genre that you're writing in, and you have to understand the tropes used in that genre. How, how they are used, why they are used, and how they don't work. And, you know, um, context. Context is another important thing. Oh, uh, yes. It's very, very easy to remove tropes from their original context, and to see then why they don't work anymore. Uh-huh. Um, probably the most obvious example I can think here in relation to horror would be Slenderman. Um, oh, Slenderman is the original context. Uh, that's another one Dead Palette had a field day with. Yep, he most certainly did, and he's right. Um, the the idea of the Slenderman monster is a great idea for a monster, and if you look at some of those original um, iterations of the Slenderman phenomenon... Uh, you know, going back to the original images, some of the stories that spawned from that, and then sort of the the pinnacle, uh, which is Marble Hornets, even though it's not technically Slender Man, but it is Slender Man, except that it isn't. <laughs> except that it is. <laughs> um, it's it's an interpretation of the Slender Man mythos. Yes, yes. Um, 
And in that original context, I mean, my God, Marble Hornets is really scary. Um, but it's almost impossible to take Slender Man seriously now because he has been removed from his original context. Mm-hmm. Um, and now you're, you're, and now when you see Slender Man and, and you aren't familiar with the, with his context, you just don't understand why he's supposed to be scary. And without that understanding, he's not scary. He's kind of funny. <laughs> yes. It's uh, it's and it's unfortunate too because the the Slender Man is an effective monster when you think about it because he represents. I think some of the best aspects of horror, which are the unknown yep. and the unidentifiable. Yes, um, to blatantly plagiarize the ideas uh, that Dead Palette has said before, said before um, Slender Man is a great monster for now um, <laughs> because of his interaction with media. Um, mm. The way that he uh, almost, he's almost like a creature of media, he only really exists even in universe in media like you really only ever see him through cameras through images through pictures through text um right it's never like direct encounters with this creature uh it's interaction it's like how he manipulates media um uh-huh. and you know like in sound distortion and things like that mm-hmm. so it, it takes a lot of those ideas then marries them with more timeless ideas of horror like the you know fear of the unknown and things like that. right Yes, um, and um, I think that helps uh, ground him in a sense of reality while still keeping him uh, this fairly terrifying entity. Because and it's still keeping him cloaked in that sense of mystery. Because you know, with we live in an era where there's a lot of video documentation of like everything. You know. Yep. Mm-hmm. So having an having an having an entity that can manipulate that or can distort that is also kind of terrifying. Yes, it, it's very terrifying, and it's also very important, I think, for for creepypasta slash yes. ash can, um, because the whole thing with realist horror is, uh, uh, well, the realism, and yes. part of one of the biggest. So one of the biggest reasons that we can be pretty confident that like Bigfoot and the Loch Ness monster and all that shit don't exist is because. Everybody has a camera nowadays. Uh-huh. Everybody, even in, in the so-called developing world, the so-called third world, people have you know ca- phone, cameras on their phones, and they're not bad cameras either. They're pretty decent. No, um, and you got, we have, you got people out there who are like you know professional Bigfoot hunters, and they go out and they look for the Bigfoot, and they have all the n- n- uh, you know neatest equipment, and they don't usually turn up any super conclusive results well they don't turn up anything and here's the thing is that now you have everybody who has a camera so like everybody is now a spy for bigfoot um or spy against bigfoot or whatever it would be um and yet we have not seen an increase in the number of supposed bigfoot photos or at least we haven't seen a proportionate increase Oh yeah. Um, what about Loch Ness? I mean, you brought up Loch Ness. Same I mean, thing. Yeah, but well, every tourist ever is going to take pictures of Loch Ness. Yeah, and every uh, tourist ever knows about the monster. And now, so, yeah, and now every always. tourist has a phone. You know, it used to be yes. you know, the first sightings of the monster go back to 1933. You know, not everybody was carrying a camera back then. But now, mm-hmm. I mean, like God, how many people must go out on the lake every day? And now they all have a camera, and yet the number of photos has not increased. Um, whereas we are now getting a lot of photos of, like, really weird shit from animals that do exist. Like, uh-huh. there's one guy who, who, who in Mongolia caught a, a photo of a clouded leopard sitting on his roof. Um, <laughs> there's another guy in Florida who, who found a manatee that had intentionally beached itself so oh. that it could gorge on um, this, this, like, shrub that was up by the water's edge. Um, so We're also getting, like... And you're also getting detailed photos of, like, species we've only just discovered, too. Yes. And identified. Yes. For example, uh, this is, this is going to tie up so, this is going to tie in so many things. Um, in 2013, uh, there was announced at the end of the year the discovery of a new species of tapir. Um, Tapiris cabamani. Oh. <laughs> um, which will be... <laughs> should, I, should I go ahead and mention that the, the tapir is one of my favorite animals? Please do. Because it's like half pig, half elephant, all cute. All cute. Um, 
Yeah, so um, one of my favorite podcasts out there is the Tetrapodzoology podcast hosted by um, my friend Darren Nash and John Conway. And as the name would suggest, it's it's Tetrapodzoology, uh, a.k.a. AKA Tetzu for short. And Mm -hmm. there's a running joke uh, among the Tetzu podcast where pretty much every episode Darren will announce, Hey, did you hear there's a new species of tape here that was discovered? Um, because because he, he like there was a flub where he like said it twice in like two consecutive episodes without realizing it. Oh, okay. so now, so now there's a new species of tape here discovered every podcast. Um, That's amazing. Yes. <laughs> Nothing, the world is now nothing but tapers. Anyway, um, but yeah, so basically I'm the idea of... <laughs> oh, who would be, really? Um, huh? So now we have a world flooded with media, with, with pictures constantly being taken, which, if you're a realist horror writer, that makes your job a lot harder. Yes. Because um, it, now it's a lot easier for people to call you out on your bullshit. Uh-huh. Um, so having a monster like Slenderman that all, like plays into that is almost kind of what, in a way, the genre needs. I I concur. I feel like um, that makes it a lot harder for people to sort of invent their own cryptids unless they have some sort of way to deal with all the media. Yep. That's uh, true. Which is why, um, when it comes to horror, I tend to lean more toward uh, supernatural things, things that are already kind of ephemeral and hard to grasp with uh, concrete evidence. Uh, cryptids are always a little bit more like, it's harder for me to suspend disbelief, as cool as some cryptids are, you know what I mean? Yes, yeah, so yeah, I mean, yeah the thing is that with a lot of uh, the so-called uh, cryptids, the supposed mystery animals that are out there, is that the popular ideas about them uh, postulate that they are more or less uh, just animals. Um, they're not like mad. I mean, there, there are some crazy ideas out there about them. Um, but I mean, we just we just talked about the Bigfoot, and the Bigfoot right. is basically just an animal. Yeah, it's just a hairy ape man type thing, supposedly living. Uh, well, really everywhere. Actually, there's actually um, like I looked up like, are there any Bigfoot sightings here in Connecticut? There are. There have been like twelve, and the last one was in two thousand two. Oh, <laughs> so wow. Bigfoot gets around. Um, yeah, they're, they're pretty widespread. I've heard Bigfoot sightings in in, in in close to my neck of the woods, like up up north in, uh, in oh, yeah. California. Oh yeah, no, California has actually quite extensive um, Bigfoot sighting record, mm-hmm. as does Texas. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so the idea is that these are creatures that are supposedly they're they are just as natural as any animal you might see. I mean. They're no real inherently different from like an ape or um, you know an otter or a hedgehog. And reason- I don't know yeah, why those are the ones that came to mind, but yeah, and there's reasonable like, and it's it's relatively reasonable that they could have existed. I mean, you had the Gigantopithecus at one point. And- um, <laughs> <laughs> well, see, here's the thing. Okay, here's the thing. Um, Gigantopithecus. So the idea that like Bigfoot is some sort of like late surviving Gigantopithecus relative of some kind, um, that idea is is based on the now outdated idea that Gigantopithecus was a relative of human line apes. Um, mm. It is not. It is no. a giant orangutan relative. Yeah, um, basically. A, a giant um, orangutan but... relative, by the way, with the beautiful voice of Christopher Walken. Oh, yes. <laughs> that one. Obidu. No. No, no, forgive me for, for interrupting. Please continue. <laughs> Oh god. Okay, now I have to show off. I have to show off here. Um, so you know, so have you seen the 2016 Jungle Book? Uh, no, but I know about Christopher Walken as King Louie. Okay, um, and he is in the movie. He is a Gigantopithecus. He even oh. says it. I, oh yeah, and I was yeah. oh yeah, I was gonna say I've, I I I'm a, I'm a fan. Bleh. I'm a fan of John Debney. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. So I love. I actually really like the score. I've listened to the songs from the Jungle Book, even though I haven't seen it. Yeah. And I've heard the you know I want to be like you as mm-hmm. performed by Christopher Walken, and I actually really love the line where he goes. Now it might seem ridiculous, <laughs> but just Gigantopithecus. I'm yes. like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. I, the the um, that movie appeals to me on so many levels, and that's for one reason. I, um, I bet it does, and it's uh, streaming on Netflix. Everybody. Yes, it is. Um, but that's not what I wanted to say. What I really want to say is, um, so the actor who plays uh, 
uh, Mowgli. Neil Seti? Uh, Close personal friend. I can't find a network connection. Please connect and try again. Shut up. Um, phone. Oh, I'm sorry. Close personal friend? <laughs> yes. Yes. Of yours? Of mine, yes. Wow. <laughs> All right. That's... Maybe not close. Um, but uh, so he actually, uh, he's a good friend of my step nephew. I believe the proper term for that oh. would be. And they've like known okay. each other for years, going back even before the movie. Um, and the camp they go to is a family camp. Um, so this past year, when I when I real when I when I was you know when Jungle Book became pretty much one of my favorite movies, I was like, um, okay, yeah, I'm gonna go. <laughs> so um, I met him and we hung out for a couple days. It was really cool. Yeah, he's a really cool kid. He thought that he nice. he was very ta- he was very taken with the fact that I was a paleontologist. And every time, oh, cool. every time we would like meet somebody new, he'd go, "This this guy's a paleontologist, so he's like Ross from Friends." <laughs> <sighs> oh, now I now I just picture your voice, Commander David Schwimmer. It, just, it cracks me up. Oh God. <laughs> so, are, have we wandered too far from our, our discussion point? Because, don't get me wrong, I'm enjoying the conversation. Yeah, but... we, we have wandered, but um, I think we've, we've pretty much we've made all of our points. Yeah. Or, I, I've, I've made all of mine anyway, unless you want to make any more. Uh, no, I think I'm pretty well covered on my points. I've probably lost a few of them, but ultimately... <laughs> um, practical effects, better than CGI. <laughs> Not well in some cases, yeah. but um, context is everything. I guess that's the main point. Context is everything, and that applies to horror and the tropes that are so frequently in it as well. Uh, and a, a context can change whether a trope is a trope or a cliche. Yep. And for any aspiring writers out there, um, if you're really not sure if something is a cliche, if it's a trope, well, I'm sorry, but the only real way to find out. Is to is to do it. Is yeah, to try just, it out. Just write. You gotta write all the bad writing out of you before you start writing good writing. Yep. And that's the sad thing is that unfortunately you'll never get all of the bad out of you. Um, no, there's always gonna be some. But yeah. think of it this way, and this is the way I think of it as a writer. I've written stories that I thought were amazing in concept. They didn't turn out that well. I'm glad I wrote them because now, since I've already written that, I can't write it again. I mean, I could if I wanted to, but I have to think to myself, I've used that already. What can I do as a different idea? And it, for, it challenges you to start thinking about to get more and more creative. Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah, the only real way to be a good writer is to write. Um, mm-hmm. and, and That's true of any creative uh, outlet, but uh, yeah. writing in particular. That's true uh, of doing anything, actually, is to just do it. Um, right. And that means... You gotta, um, you gotta kind of suck up, or not suck up, suck it up. Um, two very different things. Uh, you gotta suck it up when it comes to the the fact that you know uh, you're probably gonna write a lot of bad stuff, and if you and if you choose to share that with people, then there's always the possibility that they could uh, you know point that out. Um, yes. But it, but that is also the only way to really get better. And uh-huh. as long as one, you are open to critique and open to improvement and number two uh, hoping that the critique you receive is both one uh, insightful and two um, tactfully delivered then uh, then you have uh, the makings to really start growing as a creator well said well said all right so um i think that brings this podcast to an end now well, there you go. Wow. All righty. We did it. We did it. <laughs> wow, I'm so glad we were able to do this once and we'll now never have to do it again. I certainly hope so. <laughs> I wonder what In it the means meantime, by that. Though, thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for being on the show. I really appreciate that. Um, I, know, it's all, I like talking about I like talking about this stuff. I like talking about the craft. I like pretending I know what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, I just like talking, but um, yeah. So I that's noticed. Good. Oh, oh. <laughs> and 
and that's not a bad thing because I also like talking. So we're we're good. All right, excellent, excellent. Um, so all right then. So good night, everybody, and fare you well. And remember, Castle Thunder.